Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Emmanuel Limico, and in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about a topic that really comes up in a lot of um, rhetoric and argumentation or debate classes, and that is the topic of logical fallacies. I'm going to talk about what what they are and how to avoid them. So before we get started, I would like to outline a few things about exactly what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to address the question, what are logical fallacies? I'm also going to talk about three examples, the hasty generalization fallacy, the slippery slope fallacy, and the bandwagon fallacy. And I'm also going to talk about how they can be avoided in arguments and give you some final tips about these uh, fallacies and how to avoid them before ending the presentation. So I want to thank you in advance for watching. Um, let's get started here. The question that a lot of people probably have is just what is a logical fallacy? And in simplest terms, a logical fallacy is any error uh, in reasoning or judgment um, that happens when you're making an argument and it actually makes your argument logically unsound. Um, so it's basically any holes or faults in reasoning in your argument when you're arguing when you're arguing in favor of or against any matter. There are two different types of logical fallacies. There are the formal fallacies, which refer to the form of the spoken argument, and there are also informal fallacies, which are most common. And the informal fallacies are the ones that have to do with the content or the evidence itself that is within your spoken argument. And the examples that I have are from a list. Uh, you can find a list online of you know the different types of informal fallacies that exist. And I'm only going to talk about three of them. The very first one that I'm going to talk about tonight is the hasty generalization fallacy. The hasty generalization fallacy is when you make a generalization without any evidence to support it. It's also known as stereotyping. And the example that I have is a video that was uploaded to YouTube that depicts what happens uh, in white girls and why they die in horror movies. Um, I do want to apologize in advance if uh, there's anybody watching who considers themselves to be a white female. Um, this is not meant to insult in any kind of way. Um, this is only meant to be an example of this fallacy. So here is the video. Come on! Come on! He's gonna kill us! Get up! I can't! Oh, nothing's wrong with you! I fell too! Get a kid! Get up! Finish her! So as you can see, this video does indeed show a stereotype that seems to be very prevalent in a lot of horror movies. And it is definitely not uh, something that you can say for certain will happen in every situation if a white girl, a white female, was to be found in a similar situation in real life. Um, so this is the hasty generalization fallacy. And if you really think about it, it definitely can be one of the most problematic in society. Um, because, let's face it, nobody likes to be stereotyped. So if you really think about you know, the social aspects of a hasty generalization, you can see how it, uh, it is one of those fallacies that can definitely lead to violence in certain situations and certain settings. So hasty generalization is one that we definitely want to stay away from. Um, the next one that we're going to talk about is the slippery slope fallacy. Um, the slippery slope fallacy is the fallacy that assumes a worst case scenario after a chain of improbable cause and effects. Um, the video that I found that best exemplifies this is actually uh, part of one of my favorite comedians' um, stand up shows. His name is Jim Brewer. And I do want to warn anybody uh, who is watching, if you are sensitive to any type of material that has to do with alcohol consumption, 
um, or if you're in recovery, um, I am in no way condoning the consuming of alcoholic beverages. Again, this is only meant to be educational, and this is only meant to show an example of this fallacy. Here we go. So he's, I must have seen like at least 10 people a night throwing up. I don't know what happened tonight. I must have been them hot dogs. People never learn when to quit drinking. It's, it's not that you don't have to drink. If you don't want to get sick, it's very simple. What you do is, here's an easy analogy for everybody. Next time you go drinking, you have to remember, it's like having a party, right? But the party is in your stomach. The stomach is the bouncer. He's the door guy. You don't want to annoy him, right? Now, when you have a party, you invite your friends, you invite your family, because you know everyone gets along. No problems. Same thing when you have a party in the stomach. Now, if you're going to invite alcohol, stick to one group. Like beer, you can mix up all the beer you want, because beer knows one another. <laughs> they show up the stomach. He's here, I'm telling you, man. Hey, stomach, what's up, man? Listen, it's just does beer, you know? Looking for a little party, hang out, you know? <laughs> now, you know everyone, you know Coors Light, Sam Adams, Bex. Oh, hello, he's crazy, man. <laughs> he's nuts, sir. You know Heineken, you know? And your stomach's cool with that. All right, come on in, just keep it down, all of you, understand? <laughs> beer goes, are you sure? Because there's like 20 of us here, man. <laughs> Beer goes in, having a good time. Now, a party. People find out about parties. So does other liquor. Next thing you know, a couple of scotches show up. How are you, Stormy Coach? You got a great party going on in there. Let cut you in some big pipers. What do you say? Stomach, I don't know. Come on, show them that. <laughs> Just went up and around. Now you're mixing a crowd up, stomach lets them in. Now that's when tension starts. People don't know one another, and that creates tension. Scotch is walking around with his boys. Come on, boys, look at there, look at that. <laughs> look at him, look at him. Oi! Heineken! <laughs> right here, you rot bastard, you. Don't like you. And now there's a lot of tension. You can feel it going on in there, but now everyone's showing up. Jägermeisters and Zambuka, Saki. Oh, how'd that party here tonight? <laughs> what a big party. Come and help all my friend. Come on. <laughs> now the place is packed. There's a lot of tension. Everything's getting out of control. Your stomach. Hey, hey, come on, guys. I'm not going to tell you again. Keep it down. <laughs> Pad up to here now. <laughs> And that's when the crazy people always crash the party. Who always shows up at the end of the night? Tequila. <laughs> and tequila doesn't show up alone. There's always eight or nine of them lined up. You know? <laughs> Stomach gets all brave. How you doing, tequila? Listen. Listen. All right? It's a little late. Can't let you in tonight. I'm sorry. You know? Besides, I let you in three weeks ago. You ruined the place. You hear me? <laughs> The kill's like, come on, man, we won't start no trouble, man. <laughs> we just came here to have a good time, man. <laughs> right, senor, that's right, senor. We left the worm back in the van. He won't mess with nobody, man. Like an idiot, your stomach lets in one shot of tequila. And then he sneaks in all his friends where no one's looking. Come on, man, ain't nobody looking. Go to the legs. Go get the work. We're going to go get the bone. <laughs> and then your stomach. All right, that's it. Everyone, get out. <laughs> uh, right. And with that example, we can definitely see how... Uh, how that is a an example of a slippery slope fallacy because we can't conclude with any certainty that every single um, experience when you go out you know when a person goes out to drink is going to end up just like that um, 
you know, we can't conclude with any certainty that it's going to be, you know, one beer leads to another and then, you know, that last one will lead to a, you know, drink and, um, you know, shot after shot and then finally end up with the person passing out, you know, vomiting or whatever. Um, basically, we cannot conclude that a worst case scenario is definitely going to happen um, just because it can. So. I guess to put it to put it in a different way, just because the worst can happen doesn't necessarily mean that it will. And if we really think about it, um, this is one of those fallacies that can lead to certain people having an illogical fear or phobia. Um, we can think of a person that might, you know, be completely afraid of going out and leaving their house at all because, you know, they're thinking, well, if I leave my house, I'll trip over a rock, and if I trip over a rock. I'm going to fall into the street, and if I fall into the street, I'm going to get hit by a car. And if I get hit by a car, I'm going to, you know, break every bone in my body. And if I break every bone in my body, I'll lie on the operating table, and, you know, the surgeon will, you know, slip with his knife and cut my artery or, you know, whatever the case might be. Um, just assuming the worst when it's, you know, highly unlikely, first of all. And second of all, there's no real evidence supporting that exact chain of events. So that is an example of the slippery slope fallacy. The last example that I have is the bandwagon fallacy, which is one that people are probably most uh, most aware of. Um, I'm sure, everybody knows about you know that one sports team, whatever sport you know you want to call it. Um, you know the team wasn't doing so well last year, but then all of a sudden this year they won three games in a row during the opening season, and all of a sudden, oh, you know everybody wants to be a fan. Um, without really having any basis for being a fan. Um, that is the bandwagon fallacy, and it's the basis of an argument on the popularity of the opinion without any supporting evidence. Um, the example that I have for this fallacy um, is one that comes from a, one of the better episodes of The Twilight Zone. If anybody's a fan of The Twilight Zone as I am, you'll recognize this uh, episode. It's going to be a shortened clip, and... Please enjoy. Steve, what was that? I guess it was a meteor, honey. The power's off. I'll cut across the backyard, see if the power is still on on Floral Street. Want us to leave. That's why they shut everything off. It's on. always that way. In every story I've ever read about a ship landing from outer space, nobody could leave except the people they'd sent down ahead of them. Well, I guess what we need to do is run a check of the neighborhood and find out which ones of us are really human. He got his car started. He always was an art boy. Him and his whole family. How do you figure it started, Lass? Yeah, how do you explain that? Yeah, what's the idea, Lass? Scott is my witness. You're letting something begin here that's. That's a nightmare. Any guy who'd spend his time looking up at the sky early in the morning, there's something wrong with that kind of a person. Well, this whole thing is some kind of madness. That's exactly what it is, Mrs. Goodman. Till we get this all straightened out, you ain't exactly above suspicion yourself. There's been plenty of nights you spend hours down in your basement working on some kind of radio or something. What kind of radio set you working on? You're all standing out here, all set to crucify somebody. It's the monster. It's the monster. You'd let whatever's out there walk right over us, wouldn't you? Well, some of us won't. It's Pete Van Horn. He's dead. Maybe Pete there is trying to tell us something. No. No, it's nothing of the sort. It's a kid. He's the one. It's Bob Weaver's house. Look at the see the bandwagon fallacy at work. Um, you saw the youngster at the beginning there made an assumption and because of his assumption the rest of the townspeople just seemed to fall in line with exactly what he was saying. 
Um, they didn't decide to go out and you know, explore the evidence for themselves. Um, that's essentially what the bandwagon fallacy is. And uh, actually what it can lead to, um, according to psychologists, is it can lead to something known as the mob mentality. I'm sure everybody is familiar with the story of Frankenstein and how you know the townsfolk of you know a little town up aside from Dr. Frankenstein's castle and you know Lair decided to just all get together and you know go on a on a manhunt um, without really understanding you know what the doctor was you know doing trying to do or why so that is what the bandwagon fallacy is all about. That is my last example of logical fallacies, uh, the informal type. So the next question that comes up is, you know, how do we keep from falling into these fallacies, or how do we keep from fouling? There are several things that we can do um, to make sure that we're not falling into any of these logical fallacies, and it really starts with understanding, first of all, that you know, one example simply does not define the whole. Um, you know, just because, you know, something happens one way doesn't mean that a similar situation is going to happen the exact same way. Um, so, you know, that's a problem that, you know, tends to arise in a lot of, you know, research, you know, especially when people try to just simply look for something that fits um, their thesis. Um, we need to recognize that there, that there is a diversity of outcomes that can happen. There's so many possibilities. Um, you know, it, it you know it's not always going to happen the same every single time. Um, so we need to you know use good logic and good judgment when we're forming our arguments. Um, we need to understand that you know our conclusions have to be based on realistic evidence, um, not you know things that are grandiose. Uh, not, you know, things that are far-fetched. Um, we need to recognize and avoid, you know, groupthink. And groupthink is just one of those terms that, you know, is being used now that uh, basically means the same as the bandwagon fallacy or the mob mentality. It's, you know, groupthink is when one person makes a decision and the rest of the people in that group, you know, just go after that same decision. Um, Emotional intelligence is uh, something very key also. Uh, when we're forming our arguments, we have to understand not only you know, how and why we're forming our argument the way we are based on our emotions, um, you know, being, you know, whether we're being subjective or whether we're being objective, um, but emotional intelligence also has to do with understanding how other people's emotions work and how um, our arguments are going to affect them. So really being aware not only of yourself but also of others. And for some final tips, uh, you know sometimes experience, and I'm talking about personal experience, it can really be a strong argument. Um, there's a saying that I have that experience will override argument anytime. Um, and I tend to you know, use my own experiences uh, being in prison um, to kind of exemplify this because there's a lot of people who, you know, would have their own ideas about prison reform and, you know, what it should look like when the people that, you know, make those assumptions have never, you know, been in a situation where they were in prison. Whereas I have and I know what those experiences are like. Um, a lot of cases, you know, research, that eight-letter word that, you know, sometimes people don't like to hear, um, research can definitely lead to better reasoning. And good research is the research that involves peer-reviewed articles and journals, not just, you know, going on to Google or Wikipedia. Um, we're really finding that good, sound research, but also when we're looking for research, we have to understand that for every you know, research project, there's always the group that is studied, and there's always the group that is not studied. We have to understand that sometimes uh, statistical data can be very exclusive. So we need to think outside the box. We can't just stick to what is popular, to what is mainstream. 
Um, we can't just look at things from one perspective. We have to be able to look at things from multiple perspectives and understand that you know we're just one drop of water in an entire ocean. Um, so don't just go for what is easy. Um, you know, challenge yourself and you know really you know take into account that when we challenge ourselves, we tend to see growth, you know, personal growth. So that will conclude my presentation. I'd like to thank you very much for uh, listening. Thank you very much for watching. Um, and have a wonderful night.